into into the chat that that's fine too so um i think we probably should get started with the the meat of the presentation okay so the tdm services uh set aside is a part of um in the dr cog world we have federal funding uh, available over a four-year period in what is known as the Transportation Improvement Program, and this funds a lot of uh, projects. It's probably most uh, known for funding a lot of um, infrastructure projects, um, you know, bike and ped, but also major roadway projects. Um, our member jurisdictions across nine plus counties uh, apply for funding for a lot of um, uh, you know, the roadway and, and uh, bike and ped projects through the TIP. In addition, uh, the uh, TIP has what are called some set-asides. So the set-asides are funds like this one that are set aside uh, for specific purposes. So um, what they do is they take the, you know, the larger uh, bucket of funds and they set aside um, in, in various categories funding for uh, these kinds of programs. So you can see that, and, and the reason I, I'm sharing this is there are other grant opportunities as, as well, or at least in part, that's why I'm sharing it. So some of you have been through that community mobility planning and implementation uh, process. Um, and today we're specifically, of course, talking about TDM, Transportation Demand Management Services. So as you can see, the Dr. Cog Way to Go program is funded at $8.8 .8 million. And that's all of the foundational things, including our staffing and administration of van pool and guaranteed ride home and uh, ad agency. All that is funded uh, in, that, in that Dr. Cog Way to Go program line item. We also fund currently seven, soon to be eight TMAs at $100,000 a year annually. And then what we're here talking about today is this TDM uh, set aside for non-infrastructure projects. So, so, you know, that's an important thing to note to begin with. These are non-infrastructure projects. So go ahead, Nisha. Okay. Uh, and just uh, sort of a list of some of the other, other set asides. Um, uh, that come out of that tip. And you can see sort of the, the fiscal years 2020 to 2023 listed. So those amounts are all over the um, over a four year period uh, as set asides from the tip. So go ahead, Nisha. Okay, so the purpose of uh, this particular set aside is to support marketing, outreach and research projects that reduce single occupant vehicle travel. So one way to think about this is um, these are projects that really should be complementary to the way to go effort in the region. And again, way to go is really a partnership between Dr. Cog and uh, those eight transportation management associations. So again, these are these are things that are charging towards the exact same goals, but not not covered um, in the work that's currently being done. So the goals are to reduce traffic congestion, improve our air quality. Um, we do look for projects to pilot new approaches. Um, you know, if there's something that we have not tried in the region before that we might have interest in and fund to see if it is effective and, you know, and then potentially consider, uh, you know, uh, expanding that across the region. That's one of the things we're hoping to do. We obviously are, are wanting to support healthy and active choices. I don't know if I mentioned it, but Bike to Work Day is coming up on September 22nd. Um, and we want to improve awareness and access to mobility options really for people of all ages, incomes, and abilities. So sustainable transportation modes, um, car sharing, carpooling, band pooling, transit, bike sharing, bicycling, walking. Um, the, the big one this last year, year and a half, it is a year and a half plus now, um, employer-based programs. Um, we've had quite an emphasis on uh, telework, compressed work weeks, uh, flex work, those kinds of, of things. And, and um, you know, spent more time promoting those things this last year and a half than maybe even other some of the other traditional uh, mode shift opportunities. So again, uh, this is 
uh, the, the, the set aside is made up of a portfolio of projects and programs. So that's, we'll get into the process and, and the, you know, how we go about reviewing, uh, scoring, and then selecting those, those projects. But we hope to come up with a portfolio of projects to recommend for funding. Um, again, these are within the tip. Uh, that, that's fine, Nisha, you're good. <laughs> and I mentioned these are really um, now funded through the surface transportation block grant uh, funds as opposed to CMAP. But in terms of um, sort of eligibility and some of the requirements, it's very, very similar. So let's talk a little bit about the funding levels that are available in this call. So you saw that for a four-year uh, period, it was $1.8 million. So this is a, a, a call for two-year projects for fiscal years 2022 and 2023. Um, for those that don't know, fiscal year 2022 actually starts, um, you know, in October. Uh, so again, and last time, if you'll remember, I want to make sure that, you know, we're clear on this. We did have some returned funds that were added to this total. So I think our last call was a little bit over 1.1 million. Um, and today, I think we're just at that $900,000. There is a possibility if we have some other funds uh, sort of hit uh, this account at Dr. Cog, um, and we have great projects that might, you know, um, exceed the $900,000 uh, amount in total, you know, we may be able to find some additional funding. So uh, just in terms of eligibility, this is all uh, pretty standard, but the sponsors have to be eligible to be direct recipients of these federal transportation funds. So private uh, for-profit companies are not eligible. Uh, project sponsors have to be in good standing with the state of Colorado, Secretary of State's business database. Um, scopes of work, again, have to obviously adhere to that federal STBG program guidance. And project sponsors um, must pledge local matching funds or in-kind funds as well. And we'll get to some detail on that. So in terms of the application process, uh, here we are. Start here. Attend a mandatory TDM uh, service application workshop. So that is step one. Our goal, you'll see this is a two-step process overall. Our, our, our goal um, at this early stage is sort of to identify the project concepts and perhaps have some early discussions with uh, Dr. Cog's staff. And I did hear from several of you, even in introductions, that you have some ideas and kind of um, you know, want to float those ideas and get a good sense of whether or not they're a fit or not. And that's in large part why we do this um, sort of two-step process with a letter of intent as the starting point before we do a full application. So um, we can certainly have uh, discussions, and, and that can be by email uh, about a project ideas and perhaps provide some guidance, maybe answer some questions today. Uh, but then the next step is to submit that letter of intent. Uh, we will review the letters of intent um, on my team at Dr. Cog, um, get back with you, sort of try to work through it. I mean, there may be some projects that just are not a good fit um, conceptually. Uh, for this particular call. Um, but if we can get that to a place where we say, yep, this would be a good fit um, for this particular call, we will then um, uh, invite uh, folks that have that uh, sort of letter of intent, that concept approved to apply, and we'll set, send out that application uh, to people. So uh, you submit the application, and then we get into project review and scoring. And by the way, I'll go through the timeline on, on all this uh, at the end of our presentation today. Um, the review panel uh, selects a, a, a portfolio of projects that are then recommended to the Dr. Cog committees, Transportation Advisory Committee and Regional Transportation Committee, and ultimately to our board of directors for approval. And then you're notified um, and we begin that, that contracting process. So next slide. So the review panel I mentioned, um, it's made up of both internal and external stakeholders. So we will typically have staff, uh, of course, from my division, communications and marketing and, and the way to go team. Um, we'll often invite someone, we've got a transportation per person uh, who works with the area agency on aging. That is our largest division actually at Dr. Cog. 
I have people from transportation planning and operations as well as regional planning and development. So typically we'll have four or so people from uh, uh, Dr. Cog that are involved on the review panel. And then we'll also have external stakeholders. So Aaron, uh, who is with Federal Highways, will participate, although he doesn't score, he's there to sort of advise on uh, things like eligibility. Uh, we will have someone from CDOT, uh, typically somebody from CDPHE, as well as uh, folks from Regional Air Quality Council, RTD, other TDM professionals. So, so what happens when we get these applications in is each member has an opportunity. We send those out to the reviewers. Each uh, person who's a reviewer has an opportunity to score that and we'll get into the criteria and how it's weighted. Um, but but that's, that's the first step is for folks to score that before we get together. Uh, in addition to the review committee scoring, and I'll share some detail on this too, Dr. Cobb scores on a number of um, data-based or data-driven, I should say, criteria. So, uh, it's, you know, our transportation planning and operations group will score on things like um, if, if the project is in a short uh, trip opportunity zone, if it's um, a part of an environmental justice area, an EJ area. Um, or if it's a part of one of Dr. Cobb's urban centers. And I wouldn't worry a lot about the specifics on that right now, but happy to answer any, any questions. But basically, you know, we'll try to overlay sort of the footprint of a project and make a determination. And Dr. Cobb's staff actually scores on that part of it. Uh, the panel then uh, convenes to discuss the applications and, and uh, work to reach consensus. Um, oftentimes there's a bit of back and forth as, you know, maybe a particular panelist noticed something that others didn't. And anyways, it, it's typically been um, at least a couple of uh, meetings, if not more. Um, I think this last time we ended up uh, maybe convening four times before we finally got to, to the list of projects. Um, but again, we'll, we'll put that portfolio together and then either Nisha or Steve takes that to the Dr. Cog committees and the board of directors for approval. So just a little more detail on the criteria and weighting. So that review panel scoring um, that I mentioned, that's actually 75% of the total. And you can see the data-driven scoring is 25% of the total. Uh, and you can see the things that, uh, that matter in terms of review panel scoring. And we'll go over a little bit uh, more detail on each of these areas when I think Nisha maybe walks through the application part of it. But obviously, VMT reduction um, in red uh, is, is weighted the heaviest and, you know, sort of... Um, if there's one of these things that you wanna make certain that you're able to demonstrate, um, no matter what the project is, it's ultimately about VMT reduction, um, getting single occupant vehicles off the road. Um, we also look though at level of innovation and uniqueness. Uh, replicability is really about, you know, would this project, if successful, um, could you take that and, and, and maybe implement it uh, or something like it across the region? Access um, kind of has a bit to do with, again, projects that um, uh, sort of people of all ages, incomes, and abilities would score higher here. Funding effectiveness is, is just a formula, you know, in terms of the, the dollars that are awarded, what are we getting in terms of VMT reduction? Uh, project and applicant readiness, um, you know, if, if you submit an application for a project that is not expected to be implemented, you know, for another year or two, it will score lower than something that is pretty much um, ready once you get the thumbs up. Timing and synergy, it, it can get a little bit um, uh, tricky, I guess, to, to score that one, but it's, it's really about, um, I think the ones where I've seen it score a little bit higher are, you know, have to do with uh, perhaps if it's part of, uh, if there's a roadway construction project or something like this, and this will sort of alleviate um, traffic congestion in that roadway project, um, that would probably score higher. And then I mentioned those uh, data-driven uh, scoring uh, pieces. So next slide. All right, let's talk about eligibility rules and federalizing a project. 
All right, Aaron, Aaron, this is this is your slide. Aaron, are you with us? I am, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Transitioning. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Busto. I'm with Federal Highways. Uh, our office is out in Lakewood, so I am local. Um, with this federal money, a good reminder that every project that has any amount of federal dollars is federalized. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, that includes um, a bunch of federal construction and programming requirements. Uh, I know most of you heard NEPA, Buy America, Davis Bacon Wage. You know, all of these things are included that will have to be dealt with as you go through your project. Um, so, Project emissions reduction reporting. Okay, um, 2 CFR 200 at the bottom there. That is a reminder that the federal government has, um, oh, excuse me, um, allowability criteria for all federal dollars, which is different than program eligibility requirements for federal highways. So 2 CFR would have things such as you can't use money for alcohol. You can't use money for parties and, and things like that. Where the federal highways program eligibility requirements would be what types of projects you can use the money on, possibly locations, depending on the funding source, things like that. A lot more uh, detailed specifics. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. It's quite a big thing, so I'm not going to get into all of the details of to CFR 200. Um, and then, yeah, if anybody has any eligibility questions or federal program questions, uh, I'll be here to uh, provide an answer. Um, so uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Aaron. And we'll, we'll talk just a bit more, I think, in the next couple of slides about some of that eligibility stuff. And then I, there is a, uh, a pause for questions coming up here. So we'll We'll get to that, but um, so again, obviously scopes have to adhere to federal SDBG um, guidance and at least according to what I, I think I, I heard uh, Aaron from you uh, maybe last week in an email exchange, not a lot has, has changed really from um, you know when we did this two years ago. But the good news is again, Aaron is here to, to sort of help us make the call on some of those things. This is um, just a repeat, but again, local governments, governmental agencies and nonprofits are eligible to apply for funding. Non-local governments, this is, uh, the, this is an important aspect of this, non-local government sponsors have to obtain a letter of support uh, from the applicable jurisdiction or jurisdictions uh, where the project is located, right? So it makes some sense if you're planning to do something um, uh, alongside Lakewood. In, in Lakewood, you, you have a letter of support from them. Uh, and this part, applications must be for new projects or activities. I think maybe a better way to, um, to put this is it, it actually has to be, it has to generate new VMT reduction. Um, you know, so again, um, a project that would overlap, let's say, with, um, you know, uh, TMA activities as they exist today or, you know, other things that are already in place. Uh, again, is, is not really a good good fit for this additional funding. I um, think that's it on that one. Um, and, and this is just sort of high level. And I think Jim's gonna talk a little bit more about uh, this in, in some detail, but really incentives of any kind are challenging and often ineligible. Um, uh, food typically is ineligible. Uh, oftentimes, even things that you think might make sense end up ultimately being um, a, a pretty tough go. Things like, you know, transit passes themselves. Um, there are a lot of restrictions in terms of um, sort of when those would need to be given out and, and how you would have to track all of that, that it makes it, it, makes it a real challenge. So we're happy to obviously explore uh, ideas like that, but most incentives, if you're thinking of, about them, are probably going to be ineligible. Uh, and obviously, if, if you're a TMA partner, uh, the work that you're uh, doing in the TDM set-aside 
uh, grant would have to be unique and separate from um, the partnership. Another one we've, we've heard often enough to include it on this slide is um, bike share and car share membership uh, subsidies um, are also ineligible. So I think that's it for this section and happy to take questions. And, you know, we, we can probably answer some from the Dr. Cog perspective, perspective, but also have, of course, CDOT and uh, Federal Highways here uh, to help out. Looks like Sue's got a raised hand. All right. I'm always first. Um, okay, so for eligibility, um, and you know, and probably have to drill down to find a way that this is eligible. But um, e-bike rebates. E-bike rebates. Um, can you give us a little more information, Sue? Um, so, for instance. Um, people would, uh, you know, get selected that they would qualify for, based on various criteria, for a, um, a coupon that would give them a rebate to buy an e-bike at a local retail. Uh, I, I'm going to ask if anyone from CDOT or Federal Highways um, would like to comment on that. I do know, I'll just say this specifically, um, I know generally that rolling stock, like bikes themselves, um, would be ineligible, um, but I, I don't know that we've uh, sort of in, in this process explored rebates or, you know, that'd be similar, I guess, to just a, a discount, but Aaron or anybody from the CDOT team? Oh, I can chime in on this one. Uh, and I think I just want to clarify again that you're saying a individual would receive a discount coupon to purchase a e-bike from a company. Yes. So the discount, so let's say it was two hundred dollars off, we would give them the two the bike company two hundred dollars and get that reimbursed from the grant. Okay, and this person would then own that bike? Yes. Yeah, that is not eligible. So uh, on a follow-up, so we have done a CMAC project where we did a bike pool. So is the difference that this person has an individual ownership? So um, CMAC allowed us to purchase the bicycles for the bike pool that we then owned. So if we had a bike pool where we owned the bicycles or something where Community Cycles or the grantee owns the bicycles, is that allowed, an allowable purchase? Yes, um, capital purchases for bikes uh, in a pool or, or for a bike share are eligible. You so are... The difference is who owns the bicycle. Yes. Okay, thank you. Aaron, I, I'm just gonna quickly follow up because I, like, um, I feel like we had an application last time um, where that part of it, purchasing the bikes themselves, um, was turned out not to be eligible. So is, has something changed or is, has the interpretation of that, that changed? Um, I, I don't think so, but I, I don't remember the details from that project. So I would say before we go down that um, path that we revisit to see what the details yeah. are, because yes, there are nuances to yeah. bicycle eligibility. Uh, and it wouldn't have been turned away if it was clearly eligible. So I would say let's yeah. go and, and check what that was. Yeah, I, what I'll do, we, we, we'll just take it offline, Aaron, I think. And, and Sue, we'll, we'll get you an answer. Yeah. Um, and, and, and certainly through the, yeah, through the letter of intent process or whatever, we'll be able to, uh, to get you something more definite on this. Aaron, what I'll do, I'll, I'll send over sort of just a brief description of the, that application um, from the, the, the previous cycle where I, I'm just aware that, that that part of it was not considered eligible. So yeah, I'll get that to you though offline. And Steve, if you'll recall, we had an application where it was eligible for the purchase of bicycles. Yeah. Okay. And we were awarded that. Right. Thank you. Yep. And I also see Kate Williams has her hand raised. Thank you. Um, 
So I'm wondering if you partner, you said if you partner with Lakewood, then you have to have a letter of support from them. If I submit an application that uh, partners with RTD, for example, then I'd have to have a letter of support from them, correct? Yeah, so um, RTD and CDOT are, well, it's a little bit different. Um, it's, there's, there's, um, it's called a letter of concurrence, um, where again, we've had projects, Kate, where, um, you know, maybe it's a, whatever, a mobility hub uh, at an RTD station. Um, we, reviewing this, obviously want to know that RTD is okay with you putting mobility hub stuff at, at one of their stations. So, um, yeah, so I, I think with RTD or, or CDOT in that way, it, it isn't necessarily a letter of support. It's, it's that concurrence that, you know, they're saying, yes, it's okay, um, you know, to, to, to do this stuff here. It's okay, a, that, that, that's part one. And then part two, if we yeah. have a program that, as you know, Dr. Mack covers all counties in the MPO, do we have to have support letters from everybody or do we just get one? No, okay. no, I mean, it, no, it, it, only if, um, you know, they, only if these different jurisdictions were perhaps a part of the project in, in some way, and I'm not immediately thinking of a good example, but, but something that is region wide. And I would say probably, um, I don't know, maybe half the projects underway right now are probably considered more region wide. Um, you don't you don't need to get um, uh, that letter of support from every jurisdiction. Hey, super. Let me see if I can figure out how to put my hand down now. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I don't see any other hands raised. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or just unmute and ask it. All right. I was right, going to ask roll. a quick question. Oh, oh. Steve, you didn't get away. Um, <clears throat> You mentioned earlier about bike sharing passes and memberships being ineligible, um, scooter company passes and usage fees. Does that all sort of fit in under the same umbrella? Great question, James. And I don't know, um, Aaron, do you have, do you have thoughts on that? Yes, uh, they would be under the same umbrella. So, so not eligible. Yeah, uh, the, the wrong umbrella. Um, and <laughs> yeah. just sort of then leaning on Sue's question, if we were to purchase scooters and own the scooters and operate our own quasi little scooter scheme, we could potentially get funding for those scooters, but not funding to give people access to the scooters that are already owned by other companies or buy scooters for people. Correct. Okay, thanks, Aaron. I have a question along those lines too. So transit subsidies aren't, but if we were to buy down the fare box or provide um, the costs, say like for instance, in Boulder Via Mobility was gonna provide a shuttle service and we wanted to, needed to pay them for part of the service, something like that eligible? Um, the, so um, real quick, going back to the last question then I'm gonna come back to this one. Um, Remember the bike share, and that is all capital only, not maintenance or operations or, or anything administrative. It's just a, a capital purchase. Um, okay, so now coming back to this transit question. Um, I know Steve said we don't wanna use the whole two hours, so I'm gonna try to keep this short. Um, transit pass or, or transit fare subsidies. Um, we do have a write-up in the FHWA CMAT guidance about how that can be done. And uh, one of the things among others is it has to, it can only happen during high ozone days. Um, so if you're just gonna have a shuttle that operates all the time, uh, it, you couldn't just subsidize that fare because it would have to be during specific days and then it would also have to be eligible for everybody, not just certain people or, or certain groups. So it would just have to be open for everybody to use during those periods. So yeah, I, 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 that might be something too, Aaron, if that, um, 
I don't know if 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 that guidance is uh, available. I know you and you mentioned CMAC, and of course this is STBG, so I, I wonder if it's the same or not. But I, I do remember again, sort of going round and round a bit on uh, on this and that you know that idea of ozone days. And matter of fact, we checked. I think at the time I remember we checked with RTD to see if there was some way with specific passes that they could track to assure they were only used on uh, sort of high ozone days and there just wasn't a way to do that at the time and so but i, I think this sounds like one maybe um we, we need to look into a little bit further and and you know and then provide provide some details any other questions nisha yeah it looks like jeff butts has his hand raised and then we'll go back to kate williams okay Uh, Jeff, did you want to ask your question? Not sure what happened. My Zoom just quit on me and restarted. But my question is a follow-up to that last one, really. And it's um, if would you be able to like subsidize the transit service and then subtract the high ozone days or is it only like a service you would provide on a high ozone day because that just seems pretty unpredictable for the traveling public aaron do you have, uh, have thoughts on that um yes i'm just thinking and processing sorry <laughs> That's um all right. yeah um I don't believe there's an allowance for that. It's um, written up in a way such that the periods of uh, transit fare subsidy would be around and on ozone alert days. And there's not much more flexibility with that. And it, it, it's not something that can be retroactive because you need to be able to show that those dates of when, well, not specifically the dates, but the program needs to be built around that, along with the rest of the ozone program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly add, you know, if, as I, as I mentioned, we had uh, done a little bit of legwork with RTD and, well, Kate, you might know, I don't know, but uh, with RTD just to determine if there was some way to, um, whatever, to, to, to issue passes that could only be used on on ozone, high ozone days, and, and we, we just were not able to get there. Uh, certainly, if somebody knows otherwise, if there's there's a way to do that, I think to Aaron's point, we can't really uh, or wouldn't really want to do this retroactively ne necessarily, but if there is some way to assure that, you know, that's how they're being used, then it feels to me like it's, it's thumbs up, but I just know what a challenge it is. Great, thank you. Uh, and we've got Kate Williams next, and I have kept an eye on, on all the other raised hands. So, uh, Kate, once you're done, we'll go over to Sue Prant. Thank you, Nisha, and thank you, Steve, for recognizing that. I'm just hoping that um, those of you who are involved with these regulations are listening to the questions that are being asked and taking them back for um, future modification of the things that are preventing people in this area from doing the work that they believe would help the situation. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. Uh, and Sue Prant, would you like to go next? Sure, sure thanks, thanks, Kate. Um, and Nisha, so uh, you said that, um, that as far as purchases of bikes or cars or something like that, so the rolling stock is, um, potentially eligible, but then what I had was the capital only no maintenance or admin. So how do you define, ad, define admin? Does that mean, you know, the processing of who's using the bike or car when, or is the promotion of like, hey, we have a new car and come use it. Is that qualified or is that considered the admin or is it considered promotion? So, um, yeah, no, you, to, admin, I just kind of grouped in with the other terms. Uh, it is sort of nebulous. It just, 
operations and maintenance uh, are not allowed for bike and pedestrian um, services. Admin, I could just kind of be under operations. Like you couldn't, um, so if you start a bike share program in a city, um, we can provide the funds for the station docks and the bikes, and then that's about it. You know, if, if there is uh, a need for bike repairs, that would need to be done by somebody else. If uh, somebody needed to run the program, that would need to be done by somebody else. Um, that's kind of where I was going with that comment. Okay. So, but then the advertising, so suppose you're hiring a marketing person or something like that to let the public know that these bikes are available, that would seem to fall under the other marketing that is allowable. Yes, marketing is allowable. Okay. Yes, marketing right. is allowable and encouraged. That really is the primary focus of, of uh, this particular uh, grant. So. So, you, so you could have a project that's part capital and part marketing. Yes, and, I, I, okay. and I'll, I'll just say this. Well, I'm going to say it to Aaron and nobody else is really listening, but I, I just, we're going to we're going to have to get to the sort of the bottom line on this because then I'll share with you the project that that's in my head from two years ago um, uh, offline. But, uh, you know, definitely the capital stock in, in that one was deemed ineligible. So anyways, we'll, we'll follow up that and, and get you an answer, Sue, for sure. All right, we've got two more questions. Um, Evan, why don't you go ahead and ask your question and then I'll read a question from chat. Evan, you're still on mute. Oh, sorry, I didn't know, I didn't hear you uh, mention my name. Okay, so uh, they said it's something about ozone action days. Um, are the projects, do the projects have to run the entire time or could they be focused on during the summer? Like ozone action days typically happening during the summer. If we wanted to encourage people to use transit on ozone action days, could it be like, a summer transit uh, program only that's focused from June, say to September, um, only on those days when we have had uh, ozone action days. Yeah, and I'll just say, Evan, uh, for sure uh, that would be that would be eligible. I think um, you know the only uh, qualifier is you know again we'll we'll look at VMT reduction. So you know a project that runs maybe two. Uh, two summers, um, you know, consecutively, you would just want to be able to demonstrate uh, significant VMT reduction. But, uh, you know, again, particularly in terms of transit passes as an incentive, that's really the only option is to, as you point out, to do it in the summer when we have the high ozone days. Thank you. That makes sense. Yep. All right. And then we've got one question in the chat, um, and that's from Jacqueline Streeter at NETC. Hey, Jacqueline. Um, so Jacqueline is basically asking a timeline question. Um, so when will yeah. the projects that are approved receive funding? Yeah, and we'll get to the timeline almost at the very end, Jacqueline. A great question. Um, we'll get through sort of the application review um, uh, recommendation stuff pretty much by the end of the year and then mm -hmm. have the contracting uh, through CDOT begin. So honestly, in in my mind about the earliest these projects could be starting um, would be uh, March timeframe of 2022. Great. I think uh, that's realistic. It's possible it goes faster or <laughs> as some know, it can go slower. All right, we better move on, I think, in the interest of time. And we're, again, we'll, we'll definitely uh, be able to answer additional questions um, um, at the end, even maybe. Sounds good. All right, we'll move on to the next. Okay, again, two step application process. Next slide. Uh, again, uh, kudos for being here. You've, uh, you know, done the first. Uh, uh, You've cleared the first hurdle in, in this process. Next slide. 
And let's just talk a little bit about that letter of intent, because that would be the next thing most of you would be doing. So it's pretty basic information. Again, we want this to be sort of high level conceptual stuff. You can see, you know, there's a request for, you know, sort of, you know, contact information and things like that. In terms of an estimated project cost, that really can be an estimate of this time, and it doesn't mean you're held to that when you get to uh, the point of application. Uh, next slide. This is sort of the meat of it, really. Part two of that letter of intent is, is the description. Um, so maximum of 500 words, just tell us what you're thinking about, um, what components um, of the project includes what you hope to achieve those outcomes and always good to sort of tie it back to you know tdm uh, set aside goals uh, again to be eligible to submit um, at least one person from your agency must be here congratulations uh, those letters of intent will be accepted for the next two weeks um, final deadline of submission september 24th at uh, 11 59 p.m and you'll send those to Kelsey, you all met Kelsey, so there's an email address. And as I mentioned before, once those come into Dr. Cog, or as they come into Dr. Cog, if we get one of those tomorrow, um, you know, our goal would be to review that and sort of turn it around with some feedback for you within a couple of days or so, or at least a couple of business days. Next slide. All right, application. Is that you, Nisha? This is me. Yes, right. absolutely. So Steve did such a great job talking through all of those, you know, those, those critical first two steps, the first one obviously being attending this call, and then the second one being the application, um, or I'm sorry, the letter of intent. Uh, once we receive the letter of intent, the committee will take a look at it, and if the letter of intent is approved, the committee will reach out to that project sponsor with an application. So I will talk you through um, part of the application process but you'll see some of this information is redundant. Again, I think Steve did a really good job emphasizing what's going to be important information um, to include. I will just do my best to, to iterate those here. Um, just a timeline, a date to be aware of. The application, which again will be sent to those project sponsors whose letter of intent was accepted, is going to be due the day before my birthday. Just a heads up, October 25th at the end of day. So do also send me like a nice... Uh, card as well, that would be fine. Um, and send this over to Kelsey. Um, her email address is right here. Subject line, you know, again, this just gives us sort of an easy way to identify that this is going to be a submission for the application. All right. So a lot of this is very straightforward. I'm not going to read through each of these, um, but just like Steve mentioned, the most critical piece of this application is going to be VMT reduction. Um, so absolutely, you know, talk about what the VMTR will look like in your proposed project. Um, having some, you know, scope for VMT reduction will absolutely, um, you know, push, push your application forward. Um, as far as, you know, this first part of the application, a lot of this information you would have already written in your letter of intent, the project title, the project type. Um, we need your contact information, obviously, um, but this is just a very high level description again of this proposal. And here is a little bit of additional information on questions six and seven about the letter of concurrence and the letter of support. So as Steve mentioned, um, and, and there's a little bit of granularity here, if your project touches CDOT right of way or a CDOT roadway, you'll need a letter of concurrence from CDOT saying we approve this project. Same thing if your project either, um, you know, is, is going to be a part of RTD property or will leverage RTD services, they too will have to provide that letter of concurrence just to say that they support this project. Um, and then as Steve mentioned too, if you are not a local government, so you're a nonprofit that's applying for a project that would take place in a municipality, you do need that local government again to write a letter of support um, saying that the government, local government supports this, this initiative. Um, so definitely do, you know, if you've got any questions about whether you need the letter of concurrence, we're happy to, to help. But as I mentioned, some of this more granular information is available in part one of the application on questions six and seven. All right. 
So here, you know, we really do want some specifics. Um, the project overview, you know, 500 words may not be a whole lot to sort of flesh out your, um, to flesh out your plan, um, but wherever you can, do provide specific details. Think through how you're going to achieve this project um, and do make sure that any project you submit has a title and description. This is really going to be, again, a great way for the committee to identify whether or not your project has value. Um, just a note here, this application and everything that's in it will become part of the official contract. Um, so whatever you write as far as goals, um, these will be a requirement for you to fulfill. And um, Jim is going to talk a little bit more about reimbursements um, later on in the presentation. All right, so again, here we are going to talk a little bit about budget. Um, this is a matched grant, and I'm actually going to turn things over to Jim to talk through some of the, the math here. Um, so Jim, would you like to sort of talk through your, your use case? Sure. As you can see, under item two, the total amount of Dr. Cog request, um, that'll tell you what your match requirement is. And so it's it's going to be 17.21% of the total project cost. So it's important to keep that in mind. It's not 17.21% of what you're requesting from Dr. Cog. It's 17.21% of your total project cost. So if you know what your total project cost is, the math is easy. You can just calculate your, your match requirement by, by multiplying the total cost by 0.1721. If you don't know that, and if you know how much, but you do know how much you want from Dr. Cog, then the math is a little bit more complicated. Um, so you can take your Dr. Cog request. There are two ways to do it. Uh, one is you can multiply it by 0.1721 and then divide that by 0.8279, and that'll tell you what your match requirement is. Or you can take the... Uh, um, the Dr. Cog request, and you can divide that by 0.8279. That'll tell you what your project total project cost is going to be. You take the total project cost and subtract out what your Dr. Cog request is, and that gives you your match. But um, or or you can send me an email, and I'll help you calculate. It. Uh, that might be the easier thing to do. But um, but just keep in mind that. 0.17 be your match requirement 0.1721 or 17.21 percent is of the total project cost not not what you're getting from Dr. Cog so just keep that in mind all right okay. we'll be taking any questions at the moment I'm just I'm, kidding. okay I'm sure that, yeah. was, <laughs> that was super helpful okay yeah, and um, I think there will be a, another area where we'll go into this in a little bit more detail. Right. Another way I like to look at this is figure out your total project cost. Um, Dr. Cog will match a maximum of 82.79% of this. All right, perfect. So moving along. Um, all right, so this is going to be another, you know, very critical piece to the application, and this is where you would fill out the funding source um, and br break it down by year. So you're going to want to say whether it's a local or a state funding source, and if you need to sort of, again, break down those amounts um, year to year, this gives you a really good way to get your total, but in increments. Um, all right, so here is very much like a very general timeline that uh, the application will ask you to fill out. Um, the only, you know, note I want to make here, and you can see salaries is listed as an example. Um, if you are using this table to fill out salaries, just be general, fill out the, the uh, title of the position as opposed to the name of the person, um, just sort of a general note that we like to make on some of these documents. Um, all right, and you know, sort of continued here, there are a lot of things that are not allowable within the grant. So I would say, as you're filling out the budget and the timeline details, do think about what's eligible when you're planning for media, equipment, and production. Um, again, be as granular as you can, and also think about what's eligible within the, the grant requirement. Same thing here, um, be aware of what's allowed under the grant. 
consultants, um, you know, physical infrastructure and vehicles, you, you know, there are lots of nuances to this grant. So again, just be aware of, of what is covered here. Um, so we're getting toward the end of the application. Um, basically here, we do just want to see a timeline based on, um, I guess, a timeline that sort of breaks down the various tasks in this project. Um, I think this chart is a little bit more complicated looking than it is. Really, we just need to see X's here. You can fill in um, the blocks with color to basically correspond with the task that was complete. Um, and the tasks in this timeline should correspond with the tasks listed in part one, question 10, uh, previous section of the application. So this will just be that more detailed breakdown here. All right, so the only note I want to make here, I think this piece of the application is very straightforward. It's asking you to list out the amounts and it's asking you to list out the data source. This column justification might be in, in question. Basically, what we are looking for here is an explanation. How did you arrive at this number here in column A that says amount and then um, and that could be could be anything from the number of residents in the municipality that you're uh, launching your project. It could be the number of commuters at an employer site. Um, basically, we need to know who this, in terms of numbers, this program will impact. Um, as far as data source, there are lots of sources of data. There's the U.S. Census. We've got, you know, DOLA numbers. So definitely um, do provide some source for the data so that we know where those numbers are coming from. So this um, formula right here, I won't say too much about this. I, I, I will say this looks a lot more complex than it is. This really isn't a challenging formula to write. Um, if we go back to the previous slide, or if in your application you go up to the previous field, all of these variables are defined. Essentially, this vehicle trips reduced um, you know, formula is, is really just the number of commuters that will be targeted by the campaign multiplied by the percent um, expected to shift. So if you think you'll find 15% success, it would be 15% as the multiplier. Um, you multiply that by the number of one-way trips per day times the number of benefit days um, so meaning the days that this program would be implemented and that will land you with this number that we need. So again, a um, lot less complicated if you are able to just reference those data points from the previous slide. Um, so just to reiterate, what we are looking for in terms of proposals is innovation. Um, and so I was really pleased to hear when we did our roundtable at the beginning of the call, so many of you have innovation kind of as the, the forefront of your project goal. That is absolutely um, going to help your project be approved. So think about how your project is innovative and how it's different and unique. That's absolutely going to help your project. Um, and finally, you know, talking about these other elements of your application that are important, replicability is really critical. We want a project that can then, you know, have utility and value outside of the region where you're deploying it. So certainly projects with replicability will be scored a little bit higher. Um, and then finally, access. We want programs that make these options more accessible to people. Um, specifically, you know, if you're able to reach disenfranchised or marginalized populations, that is another uh, big, big uh, metric here in this access um, section. All right, so Steve talked a little bit about this, effectiveness and readiness, um, and I will just reiterate, if your project is immediate, if it's got application that's got, you know, immediacy, that too will um, sort of put your project proposal ahead of others. So as Steve mentioned, if your project starts in two years, um, you know, we are going to be giving up priority to projects that start, you know, next week or next month. So I would definitely um, urge you all to think about ways you could make your project proposal more immediate. So again, if the benefits are clear, um, if they, um, you know, if your project improves congestion um, and improves the accessibility of a major roadway, then certainly those are also important um, criteria.
So that's it for the application. I know I sort of flew through those, but really it's quite self-explanatory. We just want the description. A lot of it will be, you know, um, similar to your letter of intent, um, but just wanted to uh, turn things over to you in case you have any questions about this section. Jeff, I see your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, the purpose of this grant is to reduce VMT. And we are all reducing VMT right now because none of us drove to this meeting. Boulder County is looking to going back to what they call a hybrid model where we're going to be hoteling. Uh, the technical term is video conferencing. Would video conferencing hardware be eligible? Because to do it right, you know, you're talking twelve thousand dollars, thirteen, fifteen thousand dollars per room, um, as opposed to if you have a laptop or a huddle cam, then that person is sort of left out. So, is video conferencing software or hardware eligible? Would we be eligible to like do our office and reach, you know? 80 to hundreds of employees. Aaron, would, would you have uh, thoughts on that? So this is equipment. Well, I guess I heard uh, hardware and software maybe, but. Well, mostly hardware, yeah. yeah. So videoconferencinggear.com. Um, we have not really thought about that, uh, you know, granted, the world today has changed our perspective on some things. Uh, I, we can ask, uh, we can run this up the flagpole and see. My initial answer is no, because it's not really transportation related. There are transportation benefits, but it's not necessarily transportation related. Um, you can couch a lot of things in that way of, of not using your car, um, but a lot of those things aren't necessarily transportation related. So I don't see how it would be eligible. Yeah, I think um, this is definitely one, um, you know, I, I even have some interest just sort of generally in that category. I know, you know, shortly after um, we all sort of began teleworking, um, you know, in, in, in March, a uh, year and a half ago, um, we launched an initiative, Telework Tomorrow. And I know, you know, this is again, largely about promoting and encouraging employers, businesses primarily to, um, you know, adopt telework practice and, and mention compressed work week and flex works as, work as well. But, um, you know, I know that was covered, covered under our, I believe our matched grant, but um, I would be interested, big picture, you know, what kinds of things, um, you know, might, might be eligible there. So it sounds like Aaron will get back to us on that one. You know, and, and the other side of that is, what would that software be used for? How would that be transportation related? Under 2 CFR 200, you can't use federal funds for general routine governance. And that covers a lot of things, but you, you couldn't just use it to have a meeting for your office. It would have to somehow be transportation related. Well, it'd be hardware and you'd be, the transportation would be packets. TCP IP packets. And we are very effective at reducing BMT with teleworking. And we have the opportunity to fall back or spring forward right now. And I think right now is a real clinch pin. And if we get the video conferencing done properly, then that will reduce BMT permanently. If we're using huddle cams and $99 items and stuff like that, that we can afford, people are gonna be driving into the office. And so it's definitely innovative, that's for sure. And thank you for uh, running up the flagpole and I'm glad to hear there's other interests in it too. Thanks, Jeff and Aaron. Um, Kate Williams, I do see your hand is up. I was curious if it was up from before or if you had a, a new question related to application. 
I, I did finally take it down, but then I put it back up again. So okay. it's, a, it's a new hand. I should change the color of it. Um, so I hear that um, replicability, which I can't say, replicability is a, a big criteria. And I'm wondering that uh, those who are granted this funds are going to get feedback on where their project is replicated so that they can see that that happened. Yeah, I mean, I think, Kate, it's a good, good question. Um, I don't know that we have a formal process uh, to, to do that. And um, Karen uh, Worminghouse up in, up in Boulder, you know, one of uh, the, the set aside uh, grants, uh, which was awarded was for parking cash out. And, um, you know, once, once we see, you know, sort of a final report on that and look at VMT reduction, um, you know, we certainly um, we'll consider that and, and perhaps encourage something be done region wide or whatever. But there, it, it's a good thing. I, it, it's something for us to probably note, Kate. Again, there's not really a formal process. We're just looking at some of those things that if, if we prove them in you know, one smaller area, could we look to roll it out across the region? And that might be something we'd figure out a way as an example that our, maybe our My Way to Go platform could in some way help or, or you know, web resources or just resources generally through Way to Go. Uh, and of course, ideally we, we then circle back with, um, you know, the grantee and, and give them big thumbs up and pat on the back, but there's nothing formal in place today. Okay, I just, think that maybe the review board wants to think about the fact that yeah. you can't really ask people um, to be judged on a criteria that is not then followed up on. That's all. Yeah, I think we're just, it's, it's sort of in there, boy, there's some subjectivity to that, right? If you're sitting on that review panel, you know, a certain um, individual on the panel might think that a particular project would have more or less opportunity for that uh, replicability across the region than others. And that's where, you know, as we get into those discussions in that group, we, you know, we make some decisions, but really good points. And Nisha, I'm just going to say, and it's mostly on me that I think I sort of put us a little bit behind uh, where I hope to be. And we probably should accelerate a little just to get through the, the deck. And so I'm also sort of talking to you, Jim, <laughs> but we probably should uh, speed this up a little bit. And we, we definitely can take questions up until three o'clock um, at the end of this too. So we've got two questions, yep. one in chat, and um, then I see Karen Worminghouse's uh, hand is also raised. Shall we wait till the end of the call, Steve, or take those now? Let's, let's take the three quick questions, yeah. Perfect. Well, uh, Karen, let me read out Sue's question really quickly from chat. Um, and Sue asked if the government letter is needed for the letter of intent. So basically that second step in the process, would she need to have a letter of approval from the municipality? No. But for sure for the with the application, but not for the letter of intent. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and Karen, let's go to you. Good question on the implementation and that there's more points awarded for if you can implement sooner. If there's a project that, um, say, say it's a microtransit project, um, mm -hmm. that there'd be a shuttle involved, but it requires six months of planning, but you could implement the planning process immediately. Is that... Do you see what I'm saying? Like you need six months of planning and so forth, um, but that would start day one. Is that considered immediate implementation or is it considered when the transit? Yeah, and I'll take that one too, um, Karen, again, good question. I think it's, again, there's some subjectivity there. Certainly we would, so a different um, uh, review panelist might view that a little bit differently. Um, you know, so in terms of the this is what I always tell people with respect to any um, research projects or studies generally. Um, first of all, you wanna be able to ultimately say, you know, once we do this study, here's what we're gonna learn from it and we're going to be able to reduce VMT. I, I'd sort of say the same thing, um, you know, with the planning part of this is ultimately, you know, over that two year period of this grant, we wanna be able to see the VMT reduction um, in, in total, and the fact that the first three months or six months or whatever is, is spent on planning, you know, it might score a little bit lower by review panelists in, in that project readiness um, section, but it's probably not going to hurt your application that much with kind of VMT being king. 
And Steve, that's all the questions we have. So okay. I'm, I'm happy to move on. All right, let's do it. All right. So next section is going to talk about my uh, way to go and why we are here and, and basically how we want to sort of uh, help you um, see, see your project through uh, to success. Um, as Steve mentioned, a lot of these project proposals will likely align with our way to go goals. So again, um, we are here as a resource for you. So a little bit of background on way to go. Uh, way to go is a program or a partnership with the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Um, we also have eight metro area transportation management associations. Um, I know quite a few of you are on the call today. Um, primarily, the Way to Go program is funded through CMAC um, dollars, um, air quality and congestion mitigation. So really, our, our goal is to reduce traffic congestion with the um, you know, priority of improving air quality. Um, we also solicit a lot of sponsorships for special events we do, like Bike to Work Day. We have an annual event called GoTober, which is very um, employer focused. And in addition to that, we do solicit monthly sponsorships. We have challenges and programs every month where commuters can sign up and participate independent of their employer for a chance to win prizes. Um, so while we are funded primarily through CMAC, we do also have some initiatives that bring in additional funding. So here you can see just a map of all of the partners in our region. Um, again, there are eight TMA partners and um, really spread out throughout the, the Denver region. Um, and as you can see, we've got quite a few um, you know, areas on this map covered by these TMA partners. Um, any, any portion of the map that is not covered um, by these colored blocks is going to be the Dr. Cobb way to go region. So we will work directly with commuters and businesses in those unshaded areas. Um, so none of this this should be, you know, um, new. We did talk a lot about commute modes earlier in this presentation, um, but basically our bread and butter as the way to go team is to promote these various commute modes. And we really want people to make a choice um, as to how they, you know, decide to get to and from work, how they get to the store. Again, um, choosing those eco-friendly options as opposed to getting in your car and driving by yourself. Um, so we achieve our goals in a variety of ways. We work directly with businesses and we give them a lot of support so that they are empowered to um, offer their employees various commute options like flexible work schedules, um, you know, uh, transit, um, bike, you know, so, so whatever those um, active transportation or again, eco-friendly transportation options are, we like to empower and enable employers to offer those to their workforce. Um, and we also deal directly with individuals, people who are looking for clarity on their choices, and maybe people who are looking for information on what the various benefits are. So again, we do outreach with quite a few um, entities in the region from individuals to businesses. And then finally, we give the public a lot of opportunities to engage in eco-friendly commuting. Um, as Steve plugged earlier, Bike to Work Day is happening in two weeks. That is one of our biggest events where we really encourage people to try an eco-friendly mode, in this case biking, um, to get to and from work. And it really empowers people again to try this in a sort of a safe and supported way. Um, and you can see here, we just offer so many various um, commute choices that they don't even fit in a single slide. Teleworking obviously is becoming such a big thing these days. We're all pretty much teleworking um, regularly these days. Um, and then we also have a school pool program. I'm just going to plug school pool for a moment. Um, we had really high registration numbers this month. I think probably related to COVID as mom and dad are going back to the workforce full time. Um, school pool is really becoming a great resource for parents and guardians of kids in the region. So just uh, really, really pleased to anytime I can talk about that program. Um, so like I said, we do a lot of campaigns, um, but we really our goal is to create behavior change. And as I talked about, you know, these various incentive programs, outreach programs we do with businesses and individuals, those are really the tactics that we employ in order to affect this behavior change. Um, right now, we've got a marketing campaign running. Um, I think, Jeff, you sort of alluded to this time that we're in right now, where people are empowered and have the ability to really make commute choices they couldn't in the past. 
Rapid Reconsideration is a marketing campaign that we uh, have live right now that really encourages people to look at where we are in this moment in time and make different choices. Um, again, we do lots of employer outreach. We work directly with employers. We give surveys out to the employee base um, just to find out what trends and opportunities exist within, you know, a, a various business. Um, we do a lot of community outreach. In fact, on September 19th, which is a Sunday, do visit, visit us at Cuatro Vientos Park. Um, we'll have a booth there to talk about Regional Vision Zero, which is our traffic safety or a uh, regional traffic safety initiative. Um, and we'll also be talking about bike to work day and giving out swag. So if you need any more incentive to come, we'll be giving away some stuff. Um, and finally, we do a lot of trip uh, tracking and planning on our My Way to Go platform. Individuals are welcome to go to mywaytogo.org. They can put in their start location, their end destination, and this tool will actually help them track, or I'm sorry, plan a trip that uses eco-friendly commute mode. So, so we sort of take a many faceted approach in supporting residents as well as businesses in offering that commute choice. Um, so again, why why are we here? What are what is the value that we bring to this um, you know group here? Well, we want to ensure the success of your project, um, and we want to help build awareness of the project as well as how this project can help further our regional goals um, around you know building commute choice and improving air quality while reducing traffic congestion. So you can see here are our goals written out very clearly. We wanna reduce the number of single occupant vehicles on the road. We wanna reduce the MT and we wanna de uh, decrease surface transportation related greenhouse gases. So again, a lot of the programs that you are all gonna propose as part of this set aside are gonna align very nicely with our way to go goals to that end. Um, we have a strong interest in making sure that your program and plan is successful. So just to talk a little bit about process, um, before filling out your application, you'll submit that letter of intent. Steve indicated that once we review those, we'll reach out to you. You'll meet with my team, the Way to Go team, either by phone or in person, um, and we are really going to talk through how to make your application as successful as possible. Our goal is to add value to whatever your vision is. So there are a couple of ways you can help support us um, as we are sort of supporting you and your program. Um, display our logo on your website. If you see social media come out from the Way to Go brand, share it, retweet it, show, show your support in other ways. Um, and certainly if we ever have, you know, event opportunities or the opportunity to release some digital collateral, do consider co-branding your materials with the way oh. to logo. Um, social media, again, great way to, to show your support. Um, and if you have other creative ideas, we would like to hear those. Um, so as I said, we are here as a resource to help you get your proposal off the ground, to help you craft an application that has a good chance of success, and really to um, help you envision a concept that will help make life better in our region. So that's, that's sort of uh, what the Way to Go team um, brings to the table. Great, um, so now I'm gonna turn things over to Jim to talk a little bit about risk assessment um, as well as the budget and timeline. And I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll just chime in again and uh, un unfair Jim, but I, I think probably to nobody's surprise, I probably put us a little bit behind. I think we have about 15 slides left to go. So maybe we just, um, we, we go through these ones pretty quickly and, and just make sure we have a little bit of time for some questions in the end, if that's okay, Jim. Okay, sure. Uh, let's talk first about the risk assessment form. We're just requiring that you uh, um, submit that with your application this time. It's pretty easy to complete. It's basically an Excel form that you complete and provide information such as, have you ever had a federal grant? You have internal infrastructure in place. Can, or do you have the ability to manage a federal grant? And have you ever had a bad audit? And do you have a lot of turnovers? So just some basic questions you answer on an Excel form. Once that form is submitted, then CDOT completes part of it and scores it based on the answers. If your agency is, is considered a high risk, then additional steps might be needed to, uh, to be able to complete the project. Okay, next slide. 
Um, if the your, uh, project will um, require a letter of concurrence from CDOT or RTD, it's important to get that done as soon as possible and formal request should be submitted by October 1st because you don't want to, they need, those agencies will need a bit, a little bit of lead time to get that to you, get that done and get that to you. So you don't wanna to have to be waiting on that when you submit your um, application. So next, pro, next slide. Um, so here again, we're going to talk about the local match. It's 17.21% of the total project cost. Um, so if your total project cost is $100,000, then your, your match requirement is going to be $17,000. And to $17,210. Um, if you need help with that, you can always send me an email and I, I can help you do that calculation. Um, there are, there's no minimum to the project, the project cost that you can, you submit. There is um, a maximum and no project may exceed 50% of total funding available. So that's the, that's about the only thing to think about there. Yeah, so that, that amount would be $450,000 okay. would be the max um, with 900,000 available. Okay. Yep. Okay, next slide, in kind. Um, so the important thing, you can meet your match requirement with in kind, most, a lot of it with in kind. The important thing to remember about in kind is that if you cannot buy it with CMAC money or pay for it with CMAC money, you can also not use it as an in kind contribution. So for example, prizes, things like that could not be used as in kind if they're donated. So you, you'd want to focus on things like, um, free media time, uh, labor, things like that, volunteer labor, um, anything that you could use CMAC money for. So that's that's the important thing to remember about in kind. Okay, next slide. Uh, budget detail. So the important thing to, uh, to keep in mind about uh, the budget is that it's, this is gonna become the, the basis for your contract. So you, you wanna make sure that you include everything and you provide enough detail that it can be part of a contract. Um, you don't have, it's tough to figure out how much you're gonna spend on everything, but it's important to think through this and make sure you include expenses, all your expenses. You can group certain expenses, uh, for example, media. You don't need to break out specific media buys, like 30 spots on channel nine. Instead, you can just describe that you're gonna use, include a multimedia effort that will include TV, radio, newspapers, social media, et cetera. Maybe just to include the media, just describe the media that you're gonna use. Um, that way you have some flexibility to utilize media as you determine when you, when you get the project going. Salary is a big one. You need to identify each position, uh, the approximate number of hours and rate for each person working on the project. Don't use people's names, just use a description of the project. Uh, for example, marketing manager, project manager, et cetera. Your second year salaries may change if you anticipate raises, if that's the case. Um, identify it as year one and year two with specific rates for each one. Okay, um, next slide. Um, when are you going to get your project going and then complete it? Think of the time frame when you might get the contract and best case is probably three months from the time Dr. Cog provides the tip list to CDOT. Um, and this she actually went through most of this but for each task, you have a description of the task, and then you're just going to um, block out or put an X in the months when you're going to complete that task. So next slide. The contracting process. Um, uh, before Betsy talked about this, but I'm going to talk about it this time. Um, the th thing to remember. Um, and this is very important. You cannot, you cannot perform any work on the contract or send an invoice. 
until the contract is fully executed. That means it has to be signed by you and it has to be signed by CDOT. And that's that's the data that is fully executed. Um, CDOT will accept your scope of work in the application and then sends the contract back to you to be signed and then return and then it's executed. Um, getting through the application and the selection process is one thing, but then there's another whole process to go through before you can spend the money, which is the contracting process. Um, so you just have to keep that in mind before you, before you start any work. Okay, next slide. Um, this is important to remember, your application will become part of your scope of work. So the, how you describe the tasks in, in your application is important. It needs to be fairly thorough and, and think of it as being part of a contract. Think through all the costs, give enough detail so we understand it, um, but not so much that it locks you in with no flexibility. List salaries by position, not person. So just keep those things in mind. And next slide, reporting. This is important, especially um, when it comes to sending an invoice to CDOT. There are actually three, two different types of reports, three reports. Status reports you would send with each reimbursement request, which is when you send a bill to CDOT. A status report, think of that as an activity report. It, you're going to be describing all the things you did to earn the money you're asking for. So anything that's on that on your on your bill, make sure you made it part of your status report. And then um, there are two, two reports that you can think of as an outcome report. One is a year-end evaluation report, which is, this is where you're gonna describe how many people you reached, how much VMT you saved. And, and so when I say outcome, that's what I mean. This is where you, this is where you describe the results you achieved in terms of VMT reduction and probably um, air quality <clears throat> and, and congestion reduction. Uh, your end of project report is essentially the same thing as a year end evaluation report. It'll cover the whole two year period of the grant. And this is where you describe the VMT reduction um, you accomplished under each task and how many people you reached and, and and it's all about outcomes. Um, so next slide. And we'll just skip past this slide because I already talked about that. Uh, your final evaluation. Uh, reimbursements. Um, let's move down to that. There's um, a lot of documentation. I know we have a person from CDOT on the line here who can probably correct anything I say here that's, that's wrong, so that's great. Um, so when you submit a, a request for reimbursement, make sure you have copies of all subcontractor invoices that you're requesting reimbursement for, copies of all expense receipts, copies of checks, general ledgers, referencing all paid expenses, Sign timesheets, um, identifying the days and hours that each employee worked and the rate of pay. And if you, you're including in-kind match, um, you have the in-kind match expenditure ledger and a drawdown page. And then also your status report, that, that's very important. That has to be included with the request for reimbursement. Next slide. Uh, this is a sample of the reimbursement form. So there, there's more training. There's a lot of training associated with these grants. So if your project is selected, you'll be required to attend reimbursement training to ensure that you provide all the material necessary to pay your expenses. So, so there'll be another, we'll go through this again uh, if your project is selected. So there'll be another opportunity to learn all this. And next slide. Schedule and timeline. So I'll turn this back over to Steve. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Jim and Nisha, you guys both did really, really well. I think you kind of got us back on, <laughs> on schedule here somewhat. So just a reminder on um, uh, some of the key dates. So application workshop today, letters of intent will be due a couple of weeks from now. 
Um, those concurrence requests, I, I know we covered that, but just make sure you get those in as early as you can. And our recommendation is to get them into CDOT or RTD by October 1st. Um, again, if we're successful sort of getting through the uh, conceptual letter of intent phase, uh, you'll be invited to apply. So we'll send you an application. Those will be due on October 25th. Uh, and our review panel will have about a week or so uh, to do the initial scoring on those. We'll, we'll convene that week of November 4th. Um, we'll get through the process where ultimately, again, we're recommending a, a portfolio of projects to our committees and to our board. Uh, hopefully culminating with um, a thumbs up from our board of, of directors on uh, December 15th. Uh, and then once uh, we get that thumbs up, that's when notifications would go out. So I think that's it. Next slide. Uh, just uh, let, let's take a little bit of time for questions and comments, um, but you can see contact information for Nisha and for Steve and for Jim, there's a web address uh, that, that has some of the additional information related to this set aside. And I want to be sure I, uh, I thank uh, Aaron from Federal Highways for being here today, and also Nate and, and Karen and, and John from CDOT for being here as well. We really appreciate all the support um, you all provide uh, for these uh, important projects. So I think with that, we, we can take 12 minutes, it looks like, for um, for questions, if there are any. If you have a question, feel free to drop it in chat and I can read it aloud or just raise your hand and uh, we, we can call on you. No questions so far. Well, this is just fantastic. I, you know, I made that promise, that bold promise up front that this would not take a, you know, a full two hours. And then I just about, uh, you know, torpedoed that myself. But um, yeah, we, we are available by email with questions. Um, I'm going to circle back with Aaron on just a couple of the open issues and, and we'll work to get answers out. Um, we'll have sort of a a group email address from um, the participants today where we can send out answers to some of those open questions, but really look forward to having discussions and then reviewing uh, letters of intent. We got a question, Karen. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to turn my video on, but quick question, VMT, um, is it just calculated straight up VMT or VMT cost, uh, cost effectiveness? That's a really good question. So you calculate the VMT, but what um, straight up VMT, but then there is a, a part of uh, the scoring. Um, so in the application, I think even your your uh, you then do calculate effectiveness. You would take, let's say, the grant is one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, or the total project cost. Divide that by uh, the VMT reduction, or the other way around. I think I said it inversely, but um, uh, it's kind of both uh, end up being considered. So, and that's a small part of the, that effectiveness is, is a small part, at least of the scoring even. Be, because like in, in the broader piece where I believe VMT is about 25% of the, the whole 20, 25 out of the yep. 100 points, is that just straight up raw VMT and cost effectiveness is factored in in a separate category? Yes, as you said it. And, and really the best thing to do, Karen, is, is uh, go to the, that web address there, look for um, the, the eligibility rules and process, which also includes scoring. And it, it actually gives you more detail uh, on, on the scoring piece. So that, that should be included in there. If, if there's any confusion on that, just reach out. Okay. And just, I guess, a, a feedback piece on that, given, given that the 900,000 isn't a whole lot of money for the number of uh, folks on this call and so forth that it seems as, as I'm understanding it because if that's raw BMT it's the the bigger projects um, potentially the more expensive projects are going to score better if they have more BMT versus having more projects at a lower cost and lower BMT do, do you see where I'm going with that I do yep and just a, just a consideration, like I guess I'm wondering is, you know, is it, is it better for the good of the whole to, to be using raw VMT versus cost effectiveness to like which which to give more weight to? Yeah, and it's, it's a really, it's a good point, uh, Karen, and we, we certainly in the review panel discussions sort of 
uh, discuss that element of it uh, too, and really just try to come up with the best uh, portfolio of, of, of projects. Uh, and again, it, it, it does, mm, uh, for the most part, it ends up coming back to sort of best bang for the buck, effectiveness for the dollars that are being um, allocated. Uh, yeah, but there's some nuance there for sure. Thank you. Yeah. share the eligibility requirements in chat. So feel free to click that link. Um, Prant, any other, you have any other questions, Nisha? Yeah, we've got a question from Sue Prant. I was what Karen was saying about, you know, large projects could potentially show a lot more VMT reductions in small projects, which may have a big bang for a buck. So asking you to be more considerate of that. Um, and also wondering if there's a minimum for projects, a minimum amount. Yeah, I think Jim covered that. No, no minimum amount. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. No minimum okay. and the max would be for this call would be 450,000. Okay, sorry. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Any other questions? All right. Well, I, I I think let's call it good. And again, it's it's so great to see so many familiar faces and a few new faces. And just really appreciate all the work many of you are already doing in the region to make life better, including working on uh, traffic congestion and air quality issues. And so don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any, any questions on any of this. I know we covered a lot of ground today, but um, really appreciate your interest. Uh, in, in this grant funding and um, hope to hear from many of you soon and hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks you guys, lots of good information. Appreciate it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.